When the quarantine started, we wondered how we could get some beautiful information out there focused on sharing healthy ways to live and raise awareness about COVID-19. My name is Seth Eckert, and I lead the creative team at The Furrow, a studio based in Lexington, Kentucky. Information on how to wash your hands is incredibly important, but we also wanted to supplement that information with taking things a step further. So we gathered information from resources such as the CDC and the World Health Organization and formed short statements that were either based on general guidance or facts. To make this collaboration successful and feel cohesive, we knew we needed a brief to get everyone on the same page. We used the brief to outline the subject matter per shot, outline the deliverable specifications, and to build a visual identity for the project. Our hope was that these guardrails would give the artists room to flex their creative muscles and at the same time keep us all aligned. We relied on this format and design style to unify everything. So this included the color direction, mood, and a style frame. In building the mood, we selected geometric and abstract compositions as the scenes would be grounded by the text per frame. We chose a color palette that had enough depth to mold to each concept. And finally, we built out a frame to use as a foundation on how style, mood, and color could all come together. After we built out all of this, we started to see who might be interested in helping us out. It was really cool to get to hear back from so many artists who genuinely were excited to come on board and help us out. I'm continually hyped that I get to be a part of this awesome design and animation community. Again, huge shout out to the amazing team that sacrificed their time to come on board and help us with the project. In efforts to further impact our community, we wanted to share some insight into how some of this was made. So we're teaming up with the School of Motion and the motion designers who built this outstanding work to break down some of what took place in creating these visuals. In this video, Steve Savale takes me on a tour of his After Effects project file. Steve shows us how he used momentum and match cuts to transition scenes, how he planned for varying aspect ratios, as well as a handful of tips and workflow enhancements. In this breakdown, we get to see how organization and pre-production can streamline the animation process and how beneficial it is when collaborating with other artists. I highly suggest downloading the project file and following along with Steve and I. You can find the link in the description. So Steve, I know like out of the gate, um, you know, Alan did some amazing work um, with his frames. Uh, so what was your approach to setting up your project file, um, knowing, you know, that we had to loop things um, and also just trying to echo that that messaging of being preventionary or being preventative, not reactionary? The biggest thing for me was knowing right out of the gate what the canvas size was going to be. So knowing that we had multiple deliveries at 1920, 1080 and then 1080 by 1920, Rather than go through and create everything and then duplicate a comp and re-crop stuff, I wanted to make it as seamless as possible. So I made one composition in this right here where it is 1920 by 1920. So knowing that I could crop that in both ways, I'd have one master comp to work out of. And then for myself, just so I could kind of see for the people of you uh, who love print, the bleed areas, I did the same thing. I created kind of like this safe margin where I made a solid that was 1920 by 1080. And then I also made one uh, the opposite. So that way I can see right here, anywhere the I see the black, I know I'm not going to have motion there. I, it'll clip off and then vice versa as I flip it. That's so, really, really a smart idea a with like having like a guide layer, you know, it's like you can kind of see where things, you know, blend off off frame. It made it super simple because you can hide motion there. Exactly. Exactly. Very, very cool. So like in approaching the loop, I guess as well. So I know like we had set the comp uh, format to like seven and a half seconds. Um, and with your scene, you've got, you know, the like kind of like ominous shapes that come in and then we have this like real beautiful, you know, explosion out. What were your thoughts on like, you know, setting up the timing and things like that? Anytime I know I'm in a loop, I always try to create an object in the very beginning, whether it be the circle here or whatever my hero object is. And I make sure that the start and stop point are always the same. That way I'm always animating and working in between. So I'll set a keyframe right here for the position. I'll go to the end, make the exact same keyframe and then move things around or I'll duplicate a layer that ends up making it pretty smooth for seamless animations. Do you ever do anything in your timeline to kind of jump around? I know like one thing that I've done in the past is I'll sh uh, at the very beginning of my timeline, I'll hit shift one and it'll add a like, I don't know what you call it, like an, a marker at the very beginning and then I'll put one at the end and hit shift two. And then when I toggle between hitting the number one and two, I can jump to like the start and end. It's sometimes pretty handy. 
So I love that you bring that up. I use my timeline color coordinated. I use markers all the time. So even in this project file, if those of you following along have my project file open, as you scroll down, you can see I have some markers up at the top. So that way I know at that point, that's where I'm gonna have that big hit. So it's easy for me to see where that is as I start to cut layers. The other thing I like to do is I make markers actually on layers. So as I scroll down, you can see I have the hero circle in green, like just this bright, vibrant thing. So I know that this layer right here, as I get lost in the stack, is the main character that I need to animate. The other thing I like doing is by shapes because the way Alan built this out, it's beautiful, but it's a lot of things layered on top of each other. So I would take something simple like this square and color coordinated. So all of these would be that shape. So it's just a quick way for me to identify what's going on. Yeah, it's like some visual like references throughout your composition. That's pretty smart. And I know like, so show us how you, I think you double click on those markers, right? And you can change their colors. I know you can like write notes in there, do all kinds of stuff. Yeah, absolutely. Um, you can double click, type it, but if you don't have a marker on there, I'm on a Windows but or a PC, but if I select the layer and press the uh, Astra or S? I think it's like the What's number pad <laughs> subtraction, isn't it? Possibly. Um, I just pressed the little star yeah, above oh, that's what on the say, number yeah. pads. And that'll add it. Or if you hit, let's see, let's go back here. If you hold Alt and then press that same button, you're going to get your layer marker options. And in there, you have the option to write anything that you want, comments. So here I had the hero circle. And then you can change your label color so it just stands out a little bit more. Also, I think if you go up into your timeline layer, there's markers, and then you can do it the same way. So you get the numeric pad and then that star. That's right. It was a star, not the, not the dash. But yeah, no, layer organization, that's huge, man. Uh, especially like stuff like this that gets complex with all those layers. And, you know, for like characters and stuff, you can say like right arm, left arm. But for like some of these like shapey ones, you're like starting to get pretty creative with names, or at least I am starting to call it like, you know, Noodle Boy or, or whatever. So very, very <laughs> I think smart. I've seen Tyler Morgan. He just randomly put like Ooga Booga in something and I just started laughing. It was great. But hey, the then you know where that layer is the rest of the project, you know, where's that Ooga Booga layer? So it works, you know. So, um, so, you, so you built out your canvas, you know, I know we had the, uh, 16 by nine, nine by 16 formats during the 1920, help that lift be like a one time pass kind of thing. Um, so what, did you have any other additional, like personal constraints that you kind of ran into as you were setting up your scene, uh, or like, as you were like kind of processing through the animation itself? Yeah, no, that's a great question. Cause when you get design frames like this, especially Alan did a wonderful job kind of setting the standard of our line. It was more of the be preventative, not reactionary. So you have these looming shapes that are coming in and keeping it super simple, you get this force field that builds it out and kind of expels them away. So when it came to coming up with, how is this gonna loop? How am I gonna have this all move? And then you look at, I'm animating with some of the best people in the industry. Alan is one of my favorite designers, so I can't mess up his work. All I did was I relied on what I knew that I could do well. And that's just stripping away any type of plugins, any type of effects, like that stuff's just not needed in my opinion, and just relying on good, clean animation. So I just focus on position, scale, rotation, and then your mask paths or your paths. And then just building that up in layers, seeing how does this work? How does this react with another thing as it's moving? So like to quickly show an example, in the beginning here, I have our hero circle kind of moving around. It's supposed to feel a little scared, like things are closing in. And then it tries to fight its way out, but unsuccessfully. And I have it kind of fly down and it hits this little octagon shape here. You can do a quick RAM preview. So it flies down and it bounces off of that. So ignoring all the complexities you see, if you know how to animate a ball bounce, you know how to do exactly what I just did. It hits, bounces off. But I wanted there to be secondary motion. I wanted there to feel like something happened. I didn't want it just to kind of be stagnant. So I gave a little bit of rotation to that shape and then I added a little bit of a color shift just so your eye went there. So it felt like there was something a little bit more purposeful. So again, stripping away everything, all I did was animate the position, the rotation, and then I gave a little bit of a color hit. Yeah, I like how um, even thinking from like a high level story perspective, you know, you've you've got the shape. I know like I think Alan's original design was uh, for that one frame was just the darker shapes with the ball kind of like, you know, seemingly in this ominous space. Um, but I, you mentioned just now, you said, you know, kind of making it feel fearful. 
Uh, it's kind of like you have the ball kind of do like a little bit of a movement and you have it pick up pace when one of the other shapes comes close by as if like saying, oh no, I need to get away from that. And then you kind of have it do a little bit of a couple like frantic movements before it runs into that as if it's saying like, you know, hey, I was afraid. And then you can kind of echo that idea of how like the, the, the shapes are closing in on it to where like it can't escape and it running into that other shape was something that, you know, was just like an, an extra delightful moment that wasn't a part of the design, but it helped echo the, the story piece. Uh, which I think was, you know, really, really smart, uh, especially it kind of led into, you know, that next transition where it all explodes out as if it's like, you know, I can't get away from all this. I better, you know, push all this stuff away. So very, very cool setup there. Thanks. I know that wasn't really a question, by the way. <laughs> that was more like, you know, just hinting on the fact of like, you know, your process, you know, how you thought through some of that stuff. So, well, for example, just to quickly piggyback off that in like a 10 second response, you see the looming shapes, you know what our line is. So you can kind of get that sense that things should be closing in. But I asked my 13 year old daughter, I was like, hey, what do you think? Like when you look at this, how do you feel? And what would your approach be? And she's like, I would have the shapes attack this little circle. And I was like, perfect. So if you ever get stuck, ask for a little bit of outside help from somebody who doesn't have an animation mindset. Oh no, absolutely. So like even, uh, you know, in that next transition, um, I know initially you kind of had like the shape reveal and I think you and I had a conversation of how we would get back to that initial frame. So I know like you kind of have the shapes explode out. Do you want to talk through how you got to the, the looping aspect of it where it like kind of launched off and then some of the, like the, the things that we did to enhance that movement to make it work? Yeah, absolutely. So the idea was how do you get from this dark to this light and this explosion is what felt the most appropriate for this. So as you kind of scrub through what I have going on here, I have these shapes popping out, but again, think of a ball bounce. When it hits, it flies out. And I wanted this to feel powerful, so I don't really have it easing out. I have it easing into its resting point. So I have all of these shapes kind of exploding out in our one big circle kind of condensing in. And I liked the contrast of those movements. I thought that that amplified it a little bit more. It brought your eye center rather than make everything feel like it's a shock wave out, but still felt impactful. And then, like I said, I layer things. So that's just a whole bunch of scaling. But in my comp, at that exact same point of time, I do something with optics compensation, which is almost like a lens distortion. So if I turn this off, you can see it flattens it. And as I turn it on, it opens it up a little bit more. By opening it up a little bit more, it just gave that extra little impact and push. So that was kind of my mindset behind the quick little hit blow up. Um, and then for the looping part, looking at all of this, it would have been really easy to collapse everything in on itself, all of the shapes. But I always try to say, all right, what are the first few things that everybody would want to do? And then I try to push a little bit past that. In this case, having everything collapse in on itself didn't make any sense because why would this force field just kind of disappear and leave you on your own? So slingshotting our hero character away from all of the danger felt like the smoothest way to keep a nice little loop going on. I love it. And I know so like you, you hit on secondary action and it's fun to kind of like as you step through the frames, you can see you didn't have any one thing that was like, you know, over the top. It seems like you layered a lot of stuff. So it's like, you know, you've got the the light shift, you've got the the lens effect, you've got the um, you know, additional like circles that kind of play off the, the design that like kind of you know, like emit out from that. Um, you know, you have some shape like distortion happening when like the, the ball is hitting the bottom with some little particles that come off. So it's like, you know, as you transition between those two, those are the, the little things that, you know, the motion designer adds on top of whatever the design work is, those in between frames. But it's like, whenever I feel like you layer a bunch of those type of effects, you end with this like, you know, beautiful transition that, you know, seemingly was a little bit different than, you know, just a straight like tweening or morphing between the two. Um, so maybe, do you want to go into like some of the layering, uh, that you, got kind of built here as far as like the lighting, the adjustment layers, um, and maybe even some of like the, those secondary movements themselves, like the actual keys and stuff like that. I think that might be pretty cool to see. Yeah, absolutely. Let's kind of focus in on some of these shapes as an individual. So let's not look at everything as a whole. Let's look at just individual shapes. 
I was very lucky. Alan built this in After Effects as an animator mindset. So when it came to animating, I got to take his file and just get right into it. Like certain times I'll just rebuild things because it's easier and I understand it. In this case, I didn't have to do too much. Um, but if I start to go through this and I'm going to turn off some of this stuff to make it a little less busy for you to see. If I turn off the noise, now we can start to see that there's soft gradients going on. So it's not like we went into Photoshop and painted all of the stuff with the brush, which looks great as a still, but makes it tough with animation. So let me go through, we'll turn this off. And then Alan created this layer called glare overlay and he labeled it important. So I knew like, all right, that is going to help kind of drive this look. So if I turn this off, you can see how everything gets a little bit darker. That was to kind of boost everything below it, the colors. Is that just a gradient or what is yep. that? So if I turn that on and if I solo it, so we're only seeing that, mm -hmm. you can see it's this kind of ellipse moon shape. And then the blend mode is set to soft light. So if I turn that from soft light to normal so you can see what's going on. Looks great. That's essentially it. <laughs> and I have that parented to this big round circle base. So as that circle is animated, that glare also moves with it. Then again, it's just quickly, I can look at all of these colors right here. The purple, I look over. I know that's the pill highlight and everything going on here. If I was to turn this off, it would all disappear. So we just start with our base. What is our main shape? And then that's kind of, if I go into here, hit you so you can see my keyframes, that is essentially all of my animation. Because I guess a so lot of this stuff is like layer styles and compositing, right? Exactly. And then you'll see that there's a lot of radial shadows that kind of give that long look. We don't use motion blur. Like I use motion blur at the very end of this, even though I'm very much against it, even though I love it to kind of as things are slingshotting off to make it feel even faster. So but in that, this case, is that yep, pill shape? Ahead. I was gonna say, is that pill shape uh, like a square? Because I see you got radius on there. So yes, if you look at this, you'll see if I unhide or if, yeah, if I unhide my transform properties, it's a square. And I love doing this stuff with squares rather than circles because you can easily grab the corner of a square and move it. And then using round corners with that, you can keep it more circular based. Where if I had Bezier handles, trying to get nice clean stretches, it's just gonna get sloppy. So I tend to lean more towards doing stuff that way. And then again, it's just adding on. So if you look at this layer right out the gate, we see parent link 38. So anything that's happening on this layer is gonna happen to the layer above it. So if I turn it on, it's just a shadow with a kind of garbage mask. So now you can start to see how that's working. And then the pill highlight, which is everything on the outside. Everything's parented to this base. Everything mimics that. So I'm not animating four different things doing everything. I'm animating one piece, which is our main base. And I'm letting everything else kind of build off of that. It's a smart rig. You know, it, it kind of makes the animation lift a little bit lighter, especially like if you get into like client-esque work and they have revisions, you know, that would make your life much easier editing one shape versus five, especially if it's multiplied across an entire project. So very cool. Absolutely. And even when timing changes come in, that's the big one. When people oh, want no. things to happen a little faster or slower, you want to be able to quickly make those adjustments. Yeah, those ones are always the most challenging feedback or types of feedback. So I know like you, you had some moments where you hid um, some transitional elements and I know you have some layers here that you can see like are cut at certain times. Did you use any like cell type effects or anything to kind of help bridge the gap? So I love doing cuts and hiding cuts. And I learned this actually from working with a bunch of cell animators. Reese Parker, one of my buddies, actually is where I really kind of picked up this is in fast movement, when things are moving super quick, that's when you can hide cuts or when things change rather than morph. Early on in my career and most of my career, especially starting up and for all of you OGs, you remember when everything had to be nice, clean morphs back when the vector style became popular. So now working with cell animators and things being more 12 frames per second and that little steppy handheld feel, you can learn a couple of cheats and tricks for them. So for example, I have a quick comp that I have set up for you guys. And I literally have four keyframes. That's it, position animating left to right. And if I go into my graph editor and I play this so you can see it, nice smooth all cross. I work with the speed graph up and I also open up my reference graph, which lets me know the speed as well. I know if this line's smooth, everything else is gonna fall into place nicely. So 
at this point right here at this peak, you know that this is my fastest point of motion. So at that fastest point, that's when I'm going to cut something or that's when I'm going to have some big impact because the eye won't be able to discern it won't keep up with everything so let's say i want this circle to turn into a square i made just a quick square i set it in place and then i parent it to the circle so right here you can see it's following that so it's looking at those keyframes and those keyframes only so let's make it this whole time so if i stretch this out you can see it just sticks with it again looking at my graph editor at that fastest point that's where i'm going to cut the layers so this circle is still driving the motion of the square the cut's happening at its fastest point, but now if you watch it, your eye can't see that it's a cut. You just see that you have a circle to a square, so it feels smooth. If you do this wrong, if you're not lined up at the fastest point and you watch it, then you can kind of tell something hiccups or something doesn't feel right. So I kind of tend to hide cuts in those fastest points of motion because I think that goes over the smoothest. I love doing this as well. I feel like I've always called this the shuffle swap. I don't know if that's what the technical term is, but it feels it is like now. It is now. It always feels like that's kind of what what happens there. So that's really really cool. Very very fun technique. So I so show us I guess in the project where did you do this specifically? So the big point where that happens is right at that massive point of impact. I had a lot of different things happening, a lot of different things changing. I had a lot of keyframes going on. So sometimes starting with a fresh layer, just a fresh hero circle that you can see right here versus trying to make everything else kind of fit and force it is the best way to do it. Knowing that everything happens really fast at this point and this explosion out happens, I was able to just say, this is going to be my point where I can cut things and kind of have everything fly off. And because it all happens so fast, because that bright hits you, those colors, and then those shapes go flying off screen, you can literally get away with almost anything at this point. Can we see the graph editor for that? Yeah. So let's see. Let's go down to this guy. I'm going to hit U to see some keyframes. Let's go to the scale. Go over here. I have a reference graph up. There's blue lines scaling in Z space. There's no scaling in Z space happening right here. Um, but you can see that it's this fast explosion out. So again, think ball bounce. Everything kind of stems from that. Um, you get that quick speed out and then ease in, which makes it a little bit more comfortable for the eye. Love it. Very cool. So it seems like you really, in this project, you applied a lot of um, like primitive type uh, approaches to animating these scenes and transitioning a lot of these shapes. And it seems like, you know, you watch like a video like this and you think, man, that looks like really complex, but it really is just a, a, a layering application of some of those like, you know, repetitive ideas and concepts of, you know, anticipating action, you know, shuffle swap type transitions, stuff like that. So it's, it's very, very cool to see, especially, you know, you, you got your project file here so organized. So, you know, kudos again on, on that. And this project file isn't organized because it's being released to the world. This is the way that I work. And if you freelance or if you work with anybody, just keep your things organized. Man, it's it makes your life easier. You can work quicker. You're not fighting the programs as much. Absolutely. Especially like naming layers just makes your life a lot easier, even if the naming is silly. Oh, I couldn't agree more with you. So, yeah, if we watch how this looks, even this explosion out if i strip off all of the blurs everything else that's going on all the extra lighting layers it's just this which looks really boring and simple but when you combine it with everything that's what kind of brings it to life love it so steve i know that alan built all of this in after effects um do you want to walk us through uh you know the way that he outlined the uh the illustration and then you know also how you layered um the project file and named everything um as you set it up for animation yeah absolutely if you're following along again you can see that i have everything built kind of color quoted color coded for what it is so if you look over at the names you can see that's the big circle rim light the highlight shade uh more highlights etc what I'd say to do, if you're really interested in kind of seeing how this all came together, just start soloing things. Solo your main hero pieces. So the square, the big circle, the triangle. I have this base, I have a background, and then I have my hero circle character on. That's it. And if you start to do a RAM preview and watch that, 
strip everything away, you still have good clean motion and movement here. You're still looking at those animation principles, getting that squash and stretch, getting some of those smears going. That way you can kind of feel the weight. So kind of dive in and see how this is all just being driven by keyframes. For example, you know, how did I get everything to happen on an angle, but yet there's the Y position. And then if you look, start backwards engineering it. All right, so this is kind of parented to layer 33. Well, what is layer 33? That's 45. Why did he say 45? Well, if I go in here and I rotate this, any type of distance, if I go negative 45, I'm gonna turn this off because the way I was building things way then, it was a little bit different. But essentially what I did was created this going straight up and down and rotated at 45 degrees. So that way I wasn't animating curves or lines on an angle. I could animate them all in one value and then rotate things as a whole. Yes, do you know this is this is amazing to see? And I know like it, it's great that you walk through even like a a way in which you can kind of break down a file and look at and try to figure out what the other animator did. I know since everyone animates differently, and especially in After Effects, there's a thousand ways to do the same thing. So seeing the way that other animators or designers approach this type of work is always huge. So um, you know anybody listening, if you ever get an opportunity to step through a file. Um, always try to look at it and reverse engineer it in a way in which you can understand and learn like, oh, hey, that's that's how they did that. Or, you know, maybe it might even spur on some, you know, additional Googling where it's like, man, how I see they did this and they use these features. How did they do that? And then, you know, sometimes even just through discovery, you can learn some some additional things that you might have not learned before or known before. And also the teacher might not have even teacher or, you know, collaborator might have not even been trying to show you. Um, so, you know, there's little little things like that all over project files like this so uh, uh definitely dive in see what you can find and if you have any questions reach out and ask me if you're looking through my project file and you're like steve why did you do this or how did you do this or any of those questions you can reach me through email through any form of communication online thanks again to the school of motion for having us on this video is just one of three motion design walkthroughs make sure you check out the others and if you'd like to check out the entire set of animations produced on this project head over to the furrow.tv slash project slash COVID-19. Also head over to the School of Motion to find more articles, tutorials, podcasts, and courses built for beginner to advanced motion designers. You can learn how to plan and execute projects in Explainer Camp, learn how to create and illustrate mood boards and illustration for motion, or learn the fundamentals of animation in Animation Boot Camp. I hope you all enjoyed the content. Give the School of Motion some love by hitting the like button and subscribe if you want some more motion design training.